Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining our webinar on extramural opportunities to enhance the diversity of NIDCD's research workforce. I'm Deborah Tusi, and I'm the director of the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders at the National Institutes of Health. I lead the Institute's research and research training programs. We're so glad that you could join us today. We'll be talking about new NIDCD R25 funding initiatives that are designed to enhance the diversity of our extramural or off-campus research workforce working in one of our seven mission areas. And these include hearing, balance, taste, smell, voice, speech, and language. This webinar will explain the R25 programs that focus on mentoring and research experiences for individuals from diverse backgrounds. By diversity, we mean that these training programs encourage the participation of one of four groups. One, individuals from racial or ethnic groups that are underrepresented in the biomedical and behavioral sciences. Two, individuals with disabilities, including but not limited to hearing loss. Three, individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds. And four, women. All programs are designed to support at both the graduate and faculty level. We will also talk about other funding opportunities that are specifically designed to encourage the participation of individuals from diverse backgrounds. And these opportunities include the Mosaic Program, K99R00 Award, and the Brain Initiative, K99R00 Award. Both are postdoctoral career transition awards. The NIDCD is solidifying our commitment to diversity in additional ways. We will soon be seeking to hire a chief diversity officer who will lead the Institute's programs designed to address diversity and inclusion. And that job announcement should be available hopefully within the month of March. And in January, we launched a one-stop webpage called Building a Diverse Scientific Workforce where you can explore training and funding opportunities, learn about NIDCD diversity scholars, and read about our diversity initiatives. And this page is accessible through the main NIDCD webpage. Now I'd like to introduce NIDCD's extramural research training officer, Dr. Alberto Rivera Rentes, who will tell you more about our diversity-focused training opportunities. Dr. Rivera Rentes has led the NIDCD's training initiatives for extramural programs since 2015. He previously served as program director at the NIH's National Institute of General Medical Sciences, where he directed similar research training programs. He has contributed to the success of a variety of innovative NIH training programs including the prestigious NIH Director's New Innovator Award. Dr. Rivera Rentes earned his PhD in biology with a concentration in neurobiology at the University of Puerto Rico. Before he joined the NIH, he studied the biological, chemical, and physical factors associated with toxicological actions in the nervous system and the role of environmental and anthropogenic factors in respiratory and neurodegenerative conditions in Puerto Rico. With a diverse background in basic science and medicine, Dr. Rivera, Rivera Rentes has created cross-cutting interdisciplinary projects in science, research, and education sponsored by a wide variety of federal agencies. We are very fortunate to have him leading the NIDCD's training programs. And now I'll turn it over to you, Alberto. Thank you so much, Dr. Tusi, um, <clears throat> for those kind words. It's, I'm really excited to have so many people attending the webinar, and, uh, and including colleagues, and also I recognize many of, many of the names of the investigators and training officers. Uh, 
at that uh, half of our program. So thank you for taking the time on a Friday to do this. Uh, the, let me see, I'm trying to, okay. Uh, before we start, uh, everybody should be on mute. Questions at the end, please. Uh, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen uh, to submit uh, questions and please provide your name and affiliation uh, and who your question is directed to when submitting a question. This webinar is being recorded and will be available online. Also, you can type your questions in the QIA chat box uh, and there will be a QIA period at the end of the webinar. As Dr. Tushi mentioned, we are gonna talk about uh, the NIH-wide diversity targeted initiatives and programs and very exciting new NIDCD specific diversity targeted R25 programs. And you might be thinking, what is an R25 program? Well, the R25 program is a program that is designed to provide different kinds of activities uh, that allow uh, applicants to be more creative and flexible in terms of the things that they can do for research education and training. Uh, that it doesn't have many of the constraints and regulations of the typical NRSA T32 or T35 programs. These new programs at NIDCD um, are designed to encourage individuals from diverse backgrounds, uh, including those from groups underrepresented in the biomedical and behavioral sciences, uh, to pursue further studies and careers on, and or careers in biomedical research related to communication disorders uh, and NID, NIDCD mission through two independent activities. This new program, one is focused on mentoring networks and the second one is focused on research experiences. So you might be thinking, uh, what is an under, what is under representation you know, under representation for NIH? Well, the NIH issue uh, this notice of the interest on diversity uh, that uh, is at uh, NO uh, OD uh, twenty zero thirty one. You can Google that and you get the full the full documents that define um, the represented population in the U.S. Biomedical, Clinical, and Behavioral and Social Sciences Enterprise, and as Dr. So she mentioned we have uh, four categories. The first one is individuals from race, uh, racial and ethnic groups that have been shown by the NSF uh, in reports to be underrepresented in health related sciences on a national basis. The second one is individuals with disabilities who are defined as those with physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one of ma major life activities as described in the uh, American with Disabilities Act as amended. The third one is individuals from like disadvantaged backgrounds and to qualify for this category, uh, is, this is defined for people that are that, that meet two or more of the following criteria that were or are currently homeless as defined from the McKinney Bento Homeless Assistant Act. Uh, second, were or are currently on the foster care system as defined by the administration for children and families. Uh, three, were eligible for federal federal free and reduced lunch programs for two or more years. Uh, that typically is at elementary school level. Uh, had no parents or legal guardians who have completed uh, a bachelor's degree. The people who are uh, were, uh, receiving federal Pell Grants, uh, six to receive support for the special uh, supplement nutrition program for women, infants, and children, or WIC, as a parent of a child. Uh, grew up in a, one of the following areas, as rural areas defined as that de designated by the Health Resources and Services Administration or HRSA Rural Health Grants Eligibility Analyzer, or in an area designated by the Centers for Medical and Medical Aid Services as low income and health professional shortage area. You meet two or more of these criteria, you are, you are in, a, in that disadvantaged background category. And the fourth one is, uh, as like Dr. Tusi mentioned, uh, literature has shown that women from, uh, from these categories and women in general uh, represent uh, particular challenges at the graduate level and beyond uh, scientific field. But in addition, women in general have been to be shown underrepresented in doctoral granted research institutions at the senior faculty level in most biomedical relevant disciplines, and may be also represented at other faculty levels in some scientific uh, disciplines, as again, as defined by the report from the National Science Foundation. 
uh, open review of these reports in NIH uh, and the scientific disciplines in the field uh, data. NIH encourages institutions to consider faculty, uh, women for faculty level diversity targeted programs to address their recruitment, appointment, and retention or advancement. Uh, so this is basically the categories that are covered by the NIH interest in, of, in diversity. Uh, let's talk about, uh, start talking about the existing NIH-wide uh, diversity programs. Uh, at all academic levels, we have, uh, this is from high school all the way, undergraduate, post-baccalaureate, master, pre-doctoral, post-doctoral and faculty level, we have uh, research supplements and re research supplements. Uh, we have three categories, but let me explain to you first what is a research supplement. This is for investigators that are funded by NIDCD and they want to bring an individual from a diverse background as defined by the statement about that I mentioned uh, to their labs to do research training and get some experience in their particular research project that is funded by NIDCD. So we have the first one, which is the research supplements to promote diversity in health related research. This is a PA, uh, that means that it's a parent uh, announcement. Uh, PA 21071, that's the latest one. You Google that number, you get the most recent announcement. Also, NIDC has, has a specific uh, website that I, Dr. Uh, Tusi mentioned that describe what it should be included in the application, uh, the type of, of supplement and opportunities that we have there, but also we have uh, the newly uh, developed website with that has a diversity scholars that had a little blurb uh, of what the diversity uh, group is doing uh, with their mentors. But we also have, uh, I mean, uh, research supplements uh, that are administrative supplements to promote diversity in research and development in small businesses. So it is, the acronym is the SBIR STTR programs. This is a PA2, uh, it's a PA21345. And this is for individuals that have these kind of uh, awards from NIDCD, and they want to bring an individual from diverse background to, their, to participate in their small business research that they're doing. Uh, also, uh, the BRAIN initiative is you have a, a if your work or the, or the investigator work fits the uh, BRAIN initiative or is funded by the uh, BRAIN initiative, uh, they can uh, request uh, a research supplement to promote diversity and bring somebody to their lab. Uh, and this is a notice uh, of interest and it's a NOTNS 22012. So we have plenty of opportunities there for research supplements for investigators funded by NIDCD in these three categories to come and, and, and request funds uh, to bring people and enhance our diverse workforce. Uh, the other opportunity that we have is at the pre-doctoral level. A pre-doctoral means that the applicant has been accepted to a graduate PhD program. Uh, we have the, the uh, NRSA uh, diversity targeted F31 is at the PA uh, 210052. Uh, this is a fellowship. Uh, that provides a stipend and some uh, research support, tuition. Uh, typically, it, uh, it's the three to five years, and it's for people from diverse backgrounds, and it basically help you complete the PhD. In addition, uh, we participate in, uh, in the NIH Blueprint Diversity Specialized Predoctoral to Postdoctoral Advancement in Neuroscience. So this is for people that are in this part, in particular in neuroscience in, within the areas of the blueprint. And uh, it's called the D-SPAN Award in an F99K00. And I'm going to explain to you what is that. Uh, but it's an RFA. And the number is RFA uh, NS21012. And clinical trials are not allowed. Again, you Google that, you get the announcement. But this is a two-phase uh, program. You get one to two years as a fellow, basically completing your fellowship, completing your PhD, and then you have two to four years uh, at the postdoctoral level in the lab that you choose to do your postdoctoral uh, work. So it's a great opportunity to transition and come to your postdoc already having funds in your hands. At the postdoctoral level, that uh, like Dr. Tusi mentioned, uh, we have uh, two programs that we participate. Uh, the BRAIN initiative, again, is, is you have to be within the BRAIN mission areas. Uh, advancement 
advanced postdoctoral career transition award to promote diversity. This is a K99 IC00 award. These are the two numbers. I'm not going to read it. There are going to be a lot of numbers that you can Google, but if you are doing not doing a clinical trial, do you, do you go for the, four, uh, the 043? Or if you're doing a clinical trial, you go for the 044. But this is, again, uh, a, a two-phase award. It's a K99 two-year mentor uh, research experience for you to complete the postdoc. Uh, here, uh, and then um, you transition, you get a tenure track position and a research intensive institution, and you activate your R00 phase, which is three years with funds at the level of the R01. Uh, it, it, it's, it's important to mention that uh, for to be eligible for the brain initiative, you have to be from a diverse background, but also you have to be within five years of your postdoc. Then uh, the other program, which is also a K99 R00, it, this is more general for general areas of NIDCD are not necessarily brain initiative uh, work. It can be from other of our uh, seven areas. Uh, it's the Mosaic Award. Mosaic meaning maximizing opportunities for scientific and academic independent careers, called Mosaic. Uh, it's a postdoctoral career trans transition award to promote diversity. For this one, the only difference from the brain, first is not brain, is more general in terms of research areas, but also you have to have four years, within four years of your postdoc, and also be from a diverse background and having a commitment for diversity. And there you have, we have three versions of this award because one doesn't allow clinical trials. The other one is for clinical trials. And then the other one is for independent basic experimental studies with humans that not necessarily means a, it's a clinical trial that is called BESH. Uh, so those are the two programs at the postdoctoral level. Now we're going to go prime time to talk about our, our new NIDCD specific diversity targeted I-25 programs. As I mentioned, we have two. The mentoring networks to enhance diversity in NIDCD's extramural research workforce is a PAR. That means that it's reviewed at NIDCD. Uh, PAR 21185. Again, you Google this number, you get the most recent announcement. And the second program is enhancing NIDCD extramural workforce diversity through research experiences. And this is a PAR 21186. So it's easier to get 185 mentoring networks, 186 research experiences. So let's talk about the first one. Uh, this is the mentoring networks, and we're going to be talking about the different features of the program. This program, you might be thinking, you know, what the program is about. Well, the, the, we support the development of NIDCD researchers from diverse backgrounds, including from uh, those from uh, the represented groups across career stages or different academic stages. That means that the participants in the program can be from undergraduate, post-baccalaureate, master level, graduate students, including both pre-doctoral AUD and medical students, postdoctoral and early to mid-career faculty. So the idea is to create mentoring networks for these different academic levels or a combination of levels. Uh, what the programs it takes, so who can uh, apply? So this is open to from professional societies, academic institutions, combination of the, or partnerships, uh, either different academic institutions or professional societies with academic institutions, the sky is the limit. In terms of the budget, uh, it's $250,000 in direct costs each year. And it pays 8% of this for the total cost as fiscal administra administrative uh, costs or indirect costs. The duration of the program is five years. And we have, we have several uh, submission days. We just passed the January one that we see a couple of applications and the next one is gonna be May. So if you're interested in this one, start writing. Uh, then we have different submission dates in the future. Uh, what can you be proposing? So you should be proposing and we will support focused, customized scientific career development activities and research related professional development activities. This is anything under the, the sky in terms of developing the the research abilities and capabilities of the participants. 
what you cannot be proposing on this program is research experiences because this is about mentoring. This is about development and the professional development of researchers. What is allowed, what you can request, you can request administrative costs, including the principal investigators, uh, support staff, consultants, advisory committee, travel, if you're gonna have an advisory committee, but also evaluation. Here for this program is an I-25, what they pay is salaries. Uh, and this is salaries defined at the institution that, that for people that do the similar activities, and that includes also fringe benefits. Uh, the 12 month appointments or full-time appointments are not allowed. Uh, and this is something because we, this is not a, a training per se program. This is a research education program. Uh, and also you can request a travel for both the invest, principal investigators and the participants. So uh, you might be thinking, well, you know, what are mentoring network activities? And this list is not limiting at all. This is just ideas. Uh, you can do activities uh, in this program for the pathway to become a researcher type of workshops. You can do research concept development activities, networks uh, development activities. You can do distant and virtual mentoring, uh, different kind of workshops from clinic basic research to trans clinical and translational research, team science activities, uh, grassmanship, publishing in peer reviewed journals, finding research funding, manage, uh, skill management development, professional development in, in terms of you know, family and research and work, uh, balancing acts, uh, career transitions, workshops, in, uh, mentoring training, but also you can request funds for mentors development. You want to uh, do activities that the mentors learn how to uh, be better mentors. Uh, sustainability for research, entrepreneurship, different careers in, bio, in the biomedical research enterprise, uh, research at, at academia, but also research and industry. So that's, as, as, uh, as you know, there are many more activities and this is just ideas that uh, to tell you what kind of activities we will be supporting through this program. Now we go to the second program which is enhancing NIDCD extramural workforce diversity through research experiences. This is the one that you can propose research experiences. And it's PAR 21186. Uh, here is the same uh, aim for the program, is the development of NIDCD researchers from diverse backgrounds, including those of the represented across career stages. It's the same focus in terms of uh, participants. You can have participants all the way from undergraduate, post back masters, all the way to uh, early to mid career faculty, uh, or the, a combination of, of both or, or several. Uh, the program, the program uh, eligible uh, will be basically academic institutions that have researchers uh, working in the NIPCD admission areas, or a partnership between different institutions that want to uh, exchange students and or, there are things that they can be done. So partnerships are allowed and, co and combination between research training, is, uh, research intensive institutions and minority serving institutions, the sky's the limit again. Uh, budget, like the other one, 250,000 direct costs per year with 8% uh, fiscal or indirect costs. The duration five years, uh, the submissions date is the same in both programs. Uh, we just had the, the January 27th, uh, but now the next one uh, is May 27. Uh, it's, it, um, we have several other submissions date. Writing these kind of programs takes time. So don't rush, just make sure you have a good application. The program in terms of what we support, uh, pro, uh, support and what you can request or what you propose for the program, basically is hands on authentic mentor research experiences in areas of NIDCD mission. For example, it can be summer internships or it can be a combination of summer and of semester. Uh, you decide if this is flexible for in terms of the needs of the participants and their research experience. Uh, some people need more research experience, some people that need less, and the idea is for them to publish and move on, go to graduate school, for example. Uh, you can do complementary scientific development activities. This is the kind of institutional activities that you do from uh, scientific workshops or, or uh, it, it, you know, seminars inviting uh, 
the, uh, a scientist to talk uh, to the students, uh, attendance and presentation of the findings and scientific professional meetings and in the individualized mentoring. That means the, men the one on ones that you as a scientist and investigator have with your uh, mentees and the people in the lab. What is allowed, again, administrative costs uh, for, for the PI or the PIs, uh, staff support, consultants, advisory committee travel and evaluation. Uh, participants, again, they're paid salaries. It's important to know that, again, you cannot appoint uh, a full-time person for 12 continuous months is not allowed. Uh, PIs and participants travel, obviously, they're going to be presenting or attending meetings. And in addition, we provide for each participant up to $2,000 a year for research supplies. So uh, as long as you have probably funding from your out of ones or your grants, but also we are gonna provide funding for uh, perishables and different research supplies. Uh, this is basically what the program supports is research experiences. And if you have any questions, we have here our email and, uh, and we also have a, a, a section with the frequently asked questions that you, hopefully you have uh, seen, and um, if not, I invite you to uh, check and email us. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. I will now, for everyone, proceed to read the FAQs that are on the NIDCD website. Um, some questions that have come in during the webinar actually uh, are also some of the FAQs. So hopefully going through these in the next few minutes will address a lot of the fundamental questions. And then we'll get to the questions that have been submitted so far in, during the webinar. Uh, if anyone would like to submit another question, please do. And we'll get to those or to as many as we can before the uh, end of the time. So the FAQs, are answers to common questions about the NIDCD's diversity targeted R25 programs. The first FAQ is, can I propose research training and experiences as part of the mentoring networks program supported by the mentoring networks to enhance diversity in NIDCD's extramural research workforce, PAR 21185? The answer, no. The Mentoring Network R25 program only supports focused and customized scientific career development activities and research-related professional development activities. Applicants interested in programs that support research experiences must apply to the Enhancing NIDCD's Extramural Workforce Diversity Through Research Experiences, PAR 21186, that supports one, hands-on mentored research experiences at investigators' labs during the summer and or academic semester, two, complementary scientific developmental activities, three, attendance and presentation of findings at scientific professional meetings, and four, individualized dual mentoring and research training. The next question, is a letter of intent required? Answer. Even though the program announcement's guidance indicates that a letter of intent is not required, we strongly encourage applicants to work with their institutional business office to submit a letter to Alberto Rivera Rentas, PhD, as described in the announcements. Letters of intent help the NIDCD anticipate the possible number of applications that will be received. They also help the NIDCD anticipate and manage possible conflicts with potential reviewers. Lastly, communicating with Dr. Rivera Rentas early in the planning process ensures that the proposed project is aligned with program expectations. The next FAQ, who qualifies as diverse underrepresented? Answer, NIH policy identifies the following groups as underrepresented in biomedical research in the NIH's interest in diversity statement. A, individuals from racial and ethnic groups that have been shown by the National Science Foundation to be underrepresented in health-related sciences on a national basis. Blacks or African Americans, Hispanics or Latinos, American Indians or Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. B, 
Individuals with disabilities who are defined as those with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. C, individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds. D, literature shows that women from the above backgrounds, categories A, B, and C, face particular challenges at the graduate level and beyond in scientific fields. Women have been shown to be underrepresented in doctorate granting research institutions at senior faculty levels in most biomedical relevant disciplines and may also be underrepresented at other faculty levels in some scientific disciplines. NIH encourages institutions to consider women for faculty level diversity targeted programs to address faculty recruitment, appointment, retention, or advancement. Next question, can I include high school students? Answer. The inclusion of high school students is outside the scope of these programs. Programs can be targeted to undergraduates, post-baccalaureates, master's level students, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and junior faculty. Question, can the program span multiple career stages? Yes, you can design a program with participants at multiple career stages, for example, undergraduate and graduate, graduate and postdoc, or postdoc and junior faculty. Question, can I include international participants? Answer, all program participants receiving support from the R25 must be US citizens or permanent residents. Question, can we have multiple PIs? Answer, yes, but the role of each PI must be clearly delineated. The complementary and integrated expertise of each PI must be described. See the FOAs. Question, can the participating faculty work in research areas not covered by the NIDCD? Answer, the participating faculty and the mentoring and research experiences must be specifically relevant to the NIDCD mission. Researchers may be funded by other NIH institutes, federal agencies and or private foundations, as long as the proposed research and training program is relevant to the NIDCD mission. The next FAQ, is the field of dentistry included as one of the biomedical sciences for purposes of these R25 programs? Answer, the field of dentistry is part of the NIH biomedical research enterprise through the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, NIDCR. In order for an application to be eligible for NIDCD programs, it must fit the NIDCD's mission and research areas, hearing, balance, taste, smell, voice, speech, and language. Applications that explore the intersection between NIDCD research areas and the field of dentistry could be a possibility. These types of applications must demonstrate their relevance to the NIDCD. Question, can I partner with other institutions? Answer, yes. If collaborations or partnerships are proposed, provide a detailed, logistically sound, and integrated plan across the partnering institutions to improve academic and research competitiveness for the participants. Question, do I need an evaluation plan? Answer, yes, a thorough plan for program evaluation must be provided. Next question, how large should my pool of participants be? Answer, the size of the pool must be appropriate to the environment and resources available. Strong institutional support must be documented. See the FOAs. Next question, what if there are similar NIH funded programs in my institution? Answer, the proposed educational experiences must be distinct from those mentoring, research training and research education programs at your institution that currently receive federal support. When research training programs are ongoing in the same department, the applicant organization should clearly distinguish between the activities in the proposed research education program and the research training supported by the training program. Applicants are encouraged to leverage existing institutional resources to maximize program benefits. And our last FAQ, what are allowable appendix materials? Answer, the following are allowable appendix materials. Instructions provided here are in addition to the SF-424 R&R application guide instructions. Evaluation and assessment instruments. Applicants may provide blank surveys, rubrics, and or forms used to A, document and monitor trainee progress, and B, 
determine whether the program and its environment are effective, inclusive, safe, and supportive. The next kind of allowable appendix materials are research education outcomes. The application may provide information in table form on outcomes and subsequent educational career progress as appropriate to career stage about recent past five year participants, including participants in a pilot program and the pool of potential applicants, such as aggregate number and demographic characteristics of participants, educational level of participants, successful completion of a graduate degree in an NIVCD mission related field, subsequent authorship of scientific publications or scientific presentations to outside conferences in a biomedical field, subsequent participation in a formal research training or career development program in an NIDCD mission related field, subsequent participation in research in an NIDCD mission related field, subsequent employment or promotion in a research or research related biomedical field, subsequent independent research grant support from NIH or another source. The next kind of allowable appendix materials are biosketches of participating faculty in NIH format. They should include program that are, uh, sorry, preceptor, executive committee member, other committee member or other, and their mentoring record from the last 10 years. Number currently in training, graduated, completed training, and continued in research or related careers. That ends the FAQs. Uh, Alberto, anything to add to those before we move on to the questions submitted during the webinar? Let's go to the questions. Okay. Uh, Purna Koshinagar asked, for faculty supplements, do you have a preference for the career stage? For example, early, mid, or senior changing careers? So for the diversity supplements at the faculty there, and, and, and from everybody, what is important here is the need for additional mentor research training. Uh, it's not just to give funds for somebody that already is, is uh, established or is, has something ongoing. It's, there has to be a need for mentor research training. So as soon as you can make compelling case, it can be a faculty at any, at any stage. Thank you. Sri Mishra asked, can the diversity supplement be used for an undergraduate for a year? Yes, yes, definitely. We consider uh, that part of the, uh, uh, as part of something allowable, but something for you have to, I forgot to mention in the diversity supplements uh, and in many of, of, of our programs, one we one is in the career development plan or the mentoring plan that you're submitting for the candidate, you should be submitting also a, a plan for transition, the diverse candidate to a mainstream kind of research uh, training experience, either an, a, a fellowship or a T32 or another a, a, for the next uh, career stage. Thank you. Megan Gross asked, can the diversity supplement PA21071 be attached to a K career development grant, for example, K23? Unfortunately, we have uh, several mechanisms that are elig eligible for research supplements and the K, the K awards are not eligible for diversity supplements. Thank you. Purna Kashal Nagar asked, is there a recommended number on the faculty mentor size for either R25 grant? No, no, uh, we don't have any any specific number as long as the people involved has, uh, you know, have the expertise and the knowledge in the NIDCD mission areas. Thank you. Jermaine Davis asked, will slides be shared? Yes, Jermaine, they will be shared. Jermaine also asked, can one proposal include multiple levels of trainees, grad, med, and postdoc? I think the answer to that is yes, for, for both questions. Sarah Edmonds asked, can you give us an example of an individualized mentoring activity that would be covered by the research experiences R25? That's a great question. And this is the, you know, I, it's, it's mean uh, individualized because you have your participant, let's say you have an undergraduate that is finishing uh, his or her degree uh, and is gonna go for graduate school and is, you know, is you're helping them if, if with their letters of applications or the, the research statements is that kind of uh, particular customized uh, research mentoring 
uh, that happens at the lab level. The, the ones for the mentoring networks is the bigger kind of uh, broader uh, mentoring type of activities. Thank you. Yang Su Yoon asked, what are major differences between regular training grants and R25? Well, the, the regular NRSA training awards requires full-time research training. So the student has to be full-time uh, in, the, in the lab and has, been, has to be dedicated either to the fellowship or to the, to the T uh, award. In the R25, full-time appointments are not allowed. So uh, it has more flexibility in terms of the percentage of time that the, the participant is, for example, in the lab, but it cannot be a full-time uh, appointment for a year, uh, 40 hours a week in a, in, in a research award that is an R25. Thank you. Mitchell Sutter asked, for the R25 research for undergraduates, is there a requirement for a number of participating investigators that are NIDCD funded versus having research programs related to NIDCD's mission? Uh, not really. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't see that. Uh, that because we have a specific number or a required uh, number. Uh, there was. I think that's. A, there was another question from uh, before that one, uh, Barrett. Okay, um, I'm reading down the list of ones that I have here. Is there one uh, that you're looking at particularly? Alberto? I'm looking one for uh, Yolda Amo Ejeri. Uh, I don't know, I'm sorry if I mispronounced. Uh, can a diversity supplement be attached to an ECR I-21 through NIDCD? And the answer for that one is yes. Yes, that was the next one on my list. So sorry about oh, okay. that. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy Connor asked, are the diversity requirements evaluated by field? For example, in the field of communication sciences and disorders, Women from the dominant culture are overrepresented, 92% of the field. Is the NIDCD evaluating applications with specific field demographics in mind? Well, this is, uh, you remember when you apply, for example, for the diversity supplements, these are coming from institutions and there has to be an institutional uh, eligibility statement uh, indicating uh, that the, the candidate is, is from the diverse background. In addition to that, uh, institution can provide uh, evidence that, that certain groups are uh, underrepresented in certain uh, scientific area, like communication sciences and disorders, and they can they need to provide evidence of that. Either, for example, ASHA reports and other kind of uh, peer review reports. Thank you, Harunath Garudadri asked, can the application include multiple sites? For example, one an engineering team for new research tools and two, an audiology institute. We are thinking of capstone projects to train for emerging research, machine learning and hearing loss intervention. That sounds like a great idea. It's allowed, yes, definitely. Collaborations and partnerships are allowed. That's, that's something that is very useful in the I-25s. Thank you. Sarah Edmonds asked, are women in fields that do not seem to have a gender disparity, for example, psychology, eligible as underrepresented, or would they also need to show they are in a discipline that is underrepresented or have another qualification? For example, disadvantaged background. No, and it, it, just please be aware that in the statement that NIA's interest in diversity it indicates that it's, it's women at the faculty level. So uh, if, if there is a, a women uh, that is not the faculty level, it should be from, uh, it, can, it need to be qualified within the other categories. Thank you. Carolyn Baylor asked, I want to follow up on Tracy's question. I had a pre-doctoral SLP student who was an Asian American female denied submitting an application because she is not underrepresented. But as Tracy says, this is an underrepresented minority in the SLP field. And as I mentioned before, for the, this kind of diversity targeted program is the institutions that define and provide the evidence of that how the candidates is eligible for the program. Thank you. Ariel Borofsky asked, does the PI for a research administrative supplement identify a candidate first before making a request? Or do we request the supplement with the intention to specifically recruit a candidate from a diverse background? 
No, it's the, fir it's the first one. You need to identify the, the candidate first because the diversity supplement includes a career development plan that needs to address particularly uh, uh, strengths and weaknesses that are going to be mitigated uh, in, the, in the research training experience. So you need to sit down uh, with, the, with the candidate and as, do an assessment and do an individual development plan with uh, milestones, etc. But you need to identify the candidate because also the, the supplement re application requires the uh, NIH biosketch uh, uh, the, of the candidate in NIH format. Thank you. Next question, Marisha Spice Atkins asks, does this program award impact your early career status for other R-series awards? Can you be a PI for an R25, an R21, or R01 simultaneously? I, th I think the answer to that is, is yes, but it all depends on you know, how much effort you're gonna include this uh, on each different program. Uh, because running these, uh, either the mentoring networks or the I-25 is, is, is labor intensive. So you have to balance your effort. Thank you. Yaldemoy Yeti asked, for the diversity in research experience R25, can this include medical student research experience as a career stage? Or do these have to go through the medical research R25? No, it can include medical, medical research experiences as well. On the R25. This is a fine stack asked, do the mentoring participants need to be students or could they be practicing clinicians providing mentorship to transition to PhD programs? Can, can you repeat that question? I didn't hear it. That's... Oh, sorry about that. Sure. Do the mentoring participants need to be students or could they be practicing clinicians providing mentorship to transition to PhD programs? Yes, it can be uh, a clinicians too. Thank you. We had some other questions submitted before the webinar. I will now read those. First question, these were submitted anonymously or did not have uh, the names attached to them. How was biomedical sciences defined? This actually relates to an earlier FAQ, but Alberta, you may have some other information. Uh, wondering if the field of dentistry is included as it seems to stand as a separate or more independent field. Specifically, will the designed program initiatives include the field of dentistry as one of the biomedical sciences? Yeah, different, different fields as, as, as long as they are re related to NIDC's mission. Great. Dr. Fadul asked, if we designed an R25 mechanism specifically for diverse undergraduate scholars, what is the maximum length of stipend support that would be available for them as participant compensation if it is a research-based experience? Can they be supported for a summer three-month experience, a full semester, or any other duration? Or is this more designed for a workshop type or shorter experience? Uh, the answer to that is that it all depends how you define the program. I think there's flexibilities. The important thing is that, uh, that, that full-time uh, appointments are not allowed, uh, but you, you can have students for certain periods of time. Uh, you can have different durations, but it, it depends the percent of time that they're going to be dedicated to the research experience. And, and I would just add that um... <clears throat> The, the amount of the salary per year would be based on the institution's salary for similar or like positions, not necessarily the NRSA scale or training right. or fellowship scale, but within the institution scale and also reasonable. Thank you. Carolyn Quam asked, are there any plans to include the LGBTQIA plus community in these types of initiatives? So uh, the uh, sex gender minorities of the LGBTQ uh, plus uh, community uh, is at the NIH currently is considered only for health disparities research uh, because there's a need for data and is on official peer review reports from, for example, the National Academies or the NSF. We don't have the, the that particular group, the uh, LGBTQ plus uh, community, are not considered part of the diversity. Uh, as the diversity, uh, NIH uh, interest in diversity as of now. Thank you. Sandra Gordon Salant asks Do either of the NIDCD supported R25 mechanisms to promote diversity in the research workforce 
provide fellowships and tuition expenses to the trainee participants? No, these are these these are uh, more into for the research experience per se, uh, and uh, tuition for uh, short courses or fellowships are, are, are not allowed. Uh, remember, uh, participants in these programs are paid salaries, uh, so they become uh, basically an employee of the institution doing similar uh, duties as a person at the same at the same different level. So these are for research experiences uh, only. Thank you. Harunath Garudadri asked, as Dr. Rivera Rentas alluded, training in multiple disciplines is valuable. Do you have a networking opportunity, for example, sharing the participants' contacts to the attendees? That's, that's something that can be part of the mentoring network uh, uh, program that you designed. It's like we, we, we will not be prescriptive in terms of what you do in your program. That's something that, you know, you have to design the activity and, you know, you can do multiple disciplines uh, kind of mentoring networks uh, and, you know, you share your, your different uh, participants with them. Uh, I have seen very successful programs that had a group of, for example, clinician scientists that have been mentored for, by a group of more senior people that help them uh, for example, uh, this is from the, the field of otolaryngology, and you know that covers uh, different uh, areas, uh, that was very successful in helping the participants become NIH-funded investigators. Thank you. Mariam Nagilbo Hosseini asks, would you suggest a specific time or award year for submitting a diversity supplement during an R21 ECR? And that depends uh, on, you know, because the this diversity supplement is only uh, allowed to be within the active budget of the award. You have to be careful planning. Uh, for example, if you are already completed a year and you have a year and one year uh, of the R21, then you can request a diversity supplement for that particular period that you have a budget. Thank you. Those are all the questions we have received to this point. If anyone has an additional question, please take this opportunity to put it in the chat and we will be glad to answer it. Um, there is a question from Keith Josephs at Mayo Clinic. Um, and he's, uh, I think, commenting on um, the diversity of the mentors in the program. And um, Alberto, could you just touch on that a bit? Well, the, you know, the, the, the idea here for our programs is to have, like, create a community that, that could create and enhance the networks and, and the community. Having uh, investigators from diverse backgrounds be the mentors, that would be ideal. Uh, we don't, I don't have, for example, how many NIDCD uh, PIs of other ones are from diverse backgrounds. I don't have that information. Those are, those are things that the institution should be uh, proposing uh, or either creating collaborations uh, it can be, for example, a collaboration between uh, research intensive institutions that maybe don't have that many uh, professors or investigators uh, from diverse background co uh, collaborating with a minority serving institution at, uh, and HBCU or MSI, any kind of other institution that have mentors that are working in similar areas and they can collaborate. Uh, the idea here is to provide the best uh, research experience to our participants in a rigorous and a very in, uh, intense kind of in-depth in uh, research experience for the participants. Thank you. Uh, Maryam asked a follow-up question. Following up on my previous question, would you say it is reasonable to submit a diversity supplement at the beginning of an R21 award? Yes, definitely. As long as you identify the, 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 the candidate, you have the resources, you're ready to go, you can you know, submit, submit a, a diversity supplement at any time. And let me explain to you something. Uh, it, for the diversity supplements, uh, we, allow, we receive the diversity supplements on an ongoing basis. So we don't have, we don't have specific uh, submission state. You prepare the supplement with the candidate that you submitted, but something that I always encourage uh, the, the PIs uh, of the ECR or any kind of award is to consult 
with the uh, program officer of, that is your of your award. It's not me. It's the program officer that uh, that you need to be talking to. And the important and the important reason for this is because whatever you propose for the candidate to do in the diversity supplement has to be within the scope of the parent award. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. Dr. Rivera Rentes, can I clarify something? That in the research experiences R25, um, the FOA did allow for partial tuition and the costs. And I, I don't know if if um exactly uh, yeah, what well, I was that, referring to. So I don't know. Um, yeah, obviously it couldn't be for clinical courses, but um right, maybe well, cover that again. The 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 money for tuition is for those for example uh you have a student that's going to be there for that for the summer and you want them to develop uh uh statistics uh skills uh so it's, it's something has to be related to the research experience it cannot be for example let's pay uh like bi biochemistry course that they are completing for their, their bachelor's degree, for example. It has to be something that is very specific related to the program they're proposing and the research experience that the students is gonna, or, or the candidates are gonna have. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And um, just from a budget standpoint, um, if you do include tuition and it meets the criteria that Dr. Rivera has just explained, um, do not need to apply the 60% formula like for training grants and fellowships. And even when you're applying for training grants and fellowships, don't put the 60% on it because we'll do it again. Um, so go ahead and ask for, for full needs, you know, within reason and, um, you know, NIDCD will take it from there. Thank you. I have a question from Lena Rice. Can international students be included in a mentoring network where salary is not provided, but travel is reimbursed, for example, as part of workshop costs? Unfortunately, we cannot provide any kind of funding uh, for these programs to international. So travel reimbursement is not gonna be allowed. Thank you. I don't see any other questions in the chat. If anyone has a question, this would be the time to enter it. Thank you for everyone who has submitted questions. I don't see anything else coming in. So Dr. Tusi, I'll hand the reins back to you. All right, well, thank you so much for attending today. We really appreciate your interest and uh, please do let us know if you have additional questions after you review all of the information uh, that we'll post on the website. And we very much look forward to receiving your applications. Thank you. Bye-bye.